When we think about the United Nations, then we think about exactly that. An organization, a political organization bringing the nations together. And that sounds like uh, something commendable. And the question is, is that all that there is behind it? Do you remember that at the Tower of Babel, God separated the nations? Now, if you look at the headquarters of the United Nations in New York, this is really quite a fascinating building. It is large, and the name United Nations was coined by United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt and was used in the declaration by United Nations of January 1942 during the Second World War when representatives of 26 nations pledged their governments to continue fighting together against what they called the Axis Powers. Interesting name, Axis Powers. Today there's another Axis that is being fought and that is known as the Axis of Evil. Have you heard of that? The forerunner of the United Nations was the League of Nations and this was an organization in similar circumstances during the First World War and established in 1919 under the Treaty of Versailles to promote the international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. This comes straight from the UN webpage, so nothing strange about that. It's just plain history. Some more from that. In 1945, representatives of 50 countries met in San Francisco at the United Nations Conference on International Organizations and they drew up the United Nations Charter. And those delegates deliberated on the basis of proposals worked out by representatives of China, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, United States at Dumbarton Oaks, United States in August, October 1944. It was signed on 26 June 1945. 50 countries, Poland was not represented and became one of the original 51 member states. So it officially came into existence on the 24th of October 1945 when the Charter was ratified by China, France, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, United States and by a majority of the other signatories and every 24th of October they celebrate this founding of the United Nations. Now let's have a look at this Charter of the United Nations. This is a very interesting piece of history. Well, Arthur Balfour, do you remember that name? We've used it before. Who was a member of Hort's Apostles? Do you remember Hort? This is the professor that uh, helped to produce the Greek text that changed the emphasis of the Bible and removed many of the aspects of Jesus Christ's power and sovereignty from the Word of God. And the Apostles were the secret society that uh, functioned and at that time, and Hort was a member, as well as Arthur Balfour. Hort called this group a senior Apostles Club, as well as president of the Psychic Research Society, Society for Psychic Research, soon became Prime Minister of England, Arthur Balfour, and instrumental in the First League of Nations. So... This, this uh, Prime Minister was also, of course, active in the writing of the original charter of the League of Nations, much of which formed the basis for the United Nations. He not only headed the Society for Psychic Research, holding seances at his home, but he initiated a group called the Synthetic Society, whose goal was to create a one-world religion. That's a very interesting point of history. And he invited a certain Frederick Mayers of the Society of Psychic Research to join and together they created the preamble of all religions and it includes the dogma, departed spirits can communicate. Obviously, if you belong to such a society, then that is part of the situation. So, built in somewhere over there was the wish to bring all religions together. 
Now let's have a look at some of the historic figures of the United Nations. Al Gahis, he became the acting Secretary General of the establishment of the United Nations. The April 16, 1945 issue of Time magazine called him one of the State Department's brighter young men. It was his and Joseph E. Johnson who later became Secretary of the Bilderbergers, so here we have all the secret societies again, who wrote much of the United Nations Charter. So very high Freemasons, Bilderbergers, were responsible for this Charter. Now we know what they believe, we've already had a lecture on that, and I would refer people back to that lecture, patterning it after the Constitution of Russia and the Communist Manifesto. This is very interesting. So the Constitution of the USSR is almost identical to the Constitution of the United Nations, for those who did not know that. And there are all the references. Everything that I say is referenced. I'm just reading. So please, nobody get angry with me. Get angry if you want to with whoever set this thing up. I had nothing to do with it. Remember that I also pointed out in previous lectures who the responsible persons were for trying to bring all the nations together in a unitary government and then behind the scenes and other organizations to bring all the religions together. But this was not the primary or public domain. This was more the secret domain. Winston Churchill, he was the one who was also responsible, of course, after the war in setting up this whole organization. The creation of an authoritative world order is the ultimate aim to watch which we must strive, and the United Nations formed part of that. Charles de Gaulle, who was also instrumental, nations must unite in a world government or perish. So the big figures involved had this philosophy. Then there is a man, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Trigger Lee. The first official UN Secretary General was a high-ranking member of Norway's Social Democratic Party, which was, by the way, an offshoot of the Third Communist International. And then came a man, Doug Hammarskjöld. And he was the second Secretary General. He was a Swedish socialist. He openly pushed communist policy, and then came Utant, the third secretary general, and he was a Marxist. So here you can see how the philosophy in the beginning was programmed. Now, I would like you to understand that this is not a method to go anti-capitalist, because the United States was a signatory of this charter. So why would the United States actually signed something that was so obviously contrary to their own philosophy. Well, if you remember the Hegelian principle, where two opposing viewpoints are set into the world, and neither of them is really the viewpoint you want to achieve, what you really want to achieve is a synthesis between the two. So, what you see, actually, is you see socialists in the overriding capacity of secretary generals. Although, whether they have Marxist leanings or capitalist leanings at that level doesn't make any difference. The method is just to bring about a synthesis which is the desired government of all of them. So, out of this chaos, you eventually get whatever you want. Now, Utant, he was, of course, one of the earliest secretary generals. He said, world federalists hold before us the vision of a united man, unified mankind living in peace under a just world order, the heart of the program, a world under law, is realistic and attainable. Just to remind you of what we have said before. And of course, behind the scenes, always, you have the papacy. As you can see in all of these lectures, the papacy always very heavily involved. Here is Pope Paul VI, with Secretary General Utant. Now this man was a Marxist. Or let's rather put it this way. Publicly, he pushed a Marxist agenda. But if he was a true insider, then he had neither agenda, and this was just for an appearance sake, as Hegel also said. So, it is not surprising that here we have a handshake with another secretary gen gen uh, general, 
whose name was Waldheim. Now, what was the agenda or what was the political view of Waldheim? Anybody know? Anybody want to venture a guess? It became public knowledge and there was a huge, a huge outcry as a result. He was a Nazi. Yes. So you can see the Hegelian philosophy coming out here. There you have Marxism, uh, antithesis. There you have um, Nazism, thesis, in between synthesis. So it didn't really matter which of the philosophies they espoused as long as the end result was the same. Pope Paul VI, by the way, is the first one to introduce this bent cross or broken cross. Let's read about uh, what this means. Pope Paul VI wrote a papal encyclical that called on the nations to abandon sovereignty to form a world government. So the Pope himself was behind this and actually called for such a government. And about this twisted cross, here's the quote for you. Paul VI made use of a sinister symbol used by Satanists in the 6th century that had been revived at the time of Vatican II. This was a bent or broken cross on which was displayed a repulsive and distorted figure of Christ which the black magicians and sorcerers of the Middle Ages had made use of to represent the biblical term Mark of the Beast. Interesting quote. Yet not only Paul VI but his successor, the two John Pauls carried that object and held it up to be revered by the crowds who had not the slightest idea that it stood for Antichrist. So that's a quote that's very interesting about the broken cross and what it stands for. So these are the figures behind or the movers of the United Nations. A Pope calling for such an order, the Secretary Generals picking it up, reiterating it on both sides of the political divide so that uh, it would seem fair to both uh, sides of the philosophy. Now what about the spiritual aspect? There's one interfaith organization that is called the Temple of Understanding. And uh, it has a newsletter which is called World Goodwill Newsletter. Now, we have to see what authority such an organization has because there are many little organizations and they could just be, you know, irritating little piddly little organizations. So who are these people who formed the Temple of Understanding with a newsletter, the World Goodwill Newsletter, an organization affiliated to the United Nations? It's always good to look at the founders. Well, founded by Juliet Hollister in 1960, the Temple of Understanding has one of its goals, the creation of a spiritual United Nations. In its work to promote understanding between religions on the basis of the oneness of the human family. Sounds good. The Temple has numbered among its members and supporters such influential world servers as a Utant himself, well, there's the Secretary General, you can't go much higher than that. Eleanor Roosevelt, that's interesting. Thomas Merton, Yavron Nehru, Anwar Sadat, uh, Radhakrishnan, in addition to the main center of New York. So these are the top movers. So this is not some sort of uh, little organization operating somewhere in the wings. This is a hub organization. And from where did they operate? Well, they were based at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. They must be getting pretty boring by now, right? Always the same thing. The temple has active chapters in India, in the UK, representatives in Africa, Latin America, Asia, Middle East. This is a universal movement to bring all religions together. Now let's have a look at this interesting cathedral. There it is, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. The cathedral is located at the 112th Street in Amsterdam Avenue, one block east of Broadway, the largest cathedral in the world. That's also interesting. The cathedral, uh, Church of St. John the Divine in, in New York, is the mother church of the Episcopal Diocese of New York and the seat of its bishop. Remember, that's where they had the female Christ and where they have the issue of uh, ordaining homosexual bishops and all kinds of interesting stuff happen at this 
Episcopi. Right, a little bit more history. Jim Garrison, president of the New Age Gorbachev Foundation, which was this foundation that was founded by Gorbachev in New York. He said, we are going to end up with the world government. It's inevitable. There's going to be conflict, coercion, and consensus. That's all part of what will be required as we give birth to the first global civilization. So that's the agenda that they have. Philip Jessup, a CFR member, World Court Justice, pretty high up people, writes, I agree that national sovereignty is the root of all evil. So nations will obviously have to relinquish their sovereignty to this organization without it appearing as if they're doing so. The Humanist Manifesto, two states, we deplore the division of mankind on nationalistic grounds. We have reached a turning point in human history where the best option to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to be moved towards building a world community. That's Humanist Fat Manifesto 1 and 2. These are the official documents. Now this is a very interesting man, Robert Miller. He's the former Assistant Secretary General to the United Nations, but uh, he is today the mover in the spiritual field within the United Nations. He's also called the prophet of hope of the United Nations. He wrote, we must move as quickly as possible to a one world government, a one world religion, under a one world leader. That's very, very interesting. So these are the top movers. Now, the philosophy, I'm always interested in what the philosophy is and who's behind it, and again, we pick up the same old names over and over and over again. In the Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson, a survey of New Ages showed that the leading influence on their spiritual awakening was again Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Do you remember who he was? Jesuit priest. You see, they have Catholicism, the Jesuits, uh, the top movers in the United Nations. Now, what did Robert Miller, the former Assistant Secretary General, have to say? He wrote, Teilhard de Chardin had always viewed the United Nations as the progressive institution, institutional embodiment of his philosophy. Now, there is a Secretary General saying, or Under Secretary General saying, that the United Nations embodies the philosophy of Teilhard de Chardin. Now, what did Teilhard say? I've mentioned some of his philosophy. We'll look in a little bit more detail again. Teilhard wrote, Although the form is not, not yet discernible, mankind tomorrow will awaken to a pan-organized world. Pan-organized world. Well, okay, what else do you have to say? Tyler de Chardin influenced his companion, Father de Brevry, who inspired colleagues who started rich process of global and long-term thinking in the United Nations, which affected many nations and people around the world. Robert Muller says, I have myself been deeply influenced by Tyler. So, the Undersecretary General of the United Nations, who is today entrusted with the spiritual aspects of the United Nations, plus its education program, says he's influenced by Teilhard de Chardin. And Robert Miller writes, most of all they taught me happiness, his work, he says, any Teilhardian will recognize in this the spiritual transcendence which he announced so emphatically as the next step in our evolution. So there's going to be a spiritual transcendence from what appears to be political, over to the spiritual. All right, we've already seen in a previous lecture that he was a French Jesuit priest, a eugenist, a Marxist, a pantheist, a evolutionist. He might have even been involved in the Piltdown hoax. He was a humanist and a proponent of a one world government, and he's the father of the New Age. So he's a very prominent man, seems to have been very busy. He dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the Omega point. This belief has inspired many of the New Age leaders. In fact, Chardin is one of the most frequently quoted writers by leading New Age occultists. 
that we've had too when we discussed the New Age movement. But just to remind you, so we can merge into God. This is what the man looks like. This comes straight from the Jesuit web pages themselves. And uh, they'll talk about his evolutionary synthesis, world of the mind and spirit, physical world with the world of mind and spirit, the union of those. And uh, here are a few of his quotes. Just to go into a little bit of detail, this is the spirit of the philosophy of the United Nations. Interesting. It is a law of the universe that in all things there is prior existence. Before every form there is a prior but lesser evolved form. Each one of us is evolving towards Godhead. So we are all becoming God. Wonderful philosophy. What I'm proposing to do is to narrow that gap between pantheism and Christianity by bringing out what one might call the Christian soul of pantheism or the pantheist aspect of Christianity. That's fascinating. So God is in everything. God is not a separate entity. We ourselves are God or part of God. If you are a pantheist, that's what you believe. I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe. That's pantheism. It's also the philosophy of Buddhism. I believe the Messiah whom we await, whom we all without any doubt await, is the universal Christ, that is to say the Christ of evolution. But that's Teilhard de Chardin's philosophy. Isn't that interesting? So, unfortunately, I cannot agree with one single iota of that philosophy. It's not biblical. In fact, it's blasphemous. A general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfied them all. That's what Teilhard de Chardin said, Christianity and evolution. This is his quote. His quote. So a convergence of religion that satisfies them all. And he saw the United Nations as the embodiment of this philosophy. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. That means everybody must come together. Now, how do you get all the religions to come together and to bury the hatchets and their differences? You create a pain of separation, chaos, that exceeds the pain of unity. Is that understandable? That's how you do it. That's Hegelian philosophy. That is Freemason philosophy. So today we're in the pain stage, and the next phase will be unity or un inexplicable pain. That's the choice. And mankind will quite readily choose which one? The lesser pain, obviously, to survive. Now let's have a look at all these secretary generals and whether they are actually embodying this philosophy or not. This is Doug Halma Agne Karl Hammerskott. He was the Secretary General of the United Nations from 10 April 1953 to 1961. Then he met his death in a plane crash. And um, he was the fourth son of the Prime Minister of Sweden during the years of World War I. He was the first one. Now, what did he do in the United Nations? Well, one of the first things he did was to produce or create a prayer room. And there it is on the left-hand side. Uh, a stone in the middle of the room was placed to tell us we may see it as an altar, empty, not because there is no God, not because it is an altar to an unknown God, but because it is dedicated to the God who man worships under many names and many forms. Very interesting. So there is this prayer room with only this stone altar, which is built to be shaped like a... Like a, a rectangle, if you like, which has certain interesting meanings, and the whole building, the whole room, has the shape of a trapezoid. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's also an all-seeing eye, and that symbol that we see over here in the, amongst the Hittites is also the symbol, if you look carefully, of the United Nations, which has the laurel wreath and which has the face up there, which is just replaced with the earth. Now, 
Perhaps the best way to comprehend what the all-seeing eye represents is to examine the architecture of the meditation room of the United Nations building in New York. The meditation room is shaped as a pyramid, a trapezoid. Without the capstone, inside the room is dimly lit, but coming from the ceiling is a narrow but concentrated pinpoint beam of light which radiates down to a bleak stone altar. On the wall straight ahead is a breathtaking modernistic mural that is dynamically endowed with occult symbolism. Containing 27 triangles and various configurations, a mixture of black and white and colored background and a snake-like vertical line, at the center is the all-seeing eye, which grips the millions of annual UN visitors with its stark beckoning image of suspicion and omnipresence. This is the quote from Tex Mars. And some more quotes. The meditation room faces north, northeast. To enter the room, one must proceed from darkness into light. Indeed, the middle order of the satanic brotherhood is called the order of the trapezoid. That's very interesting. And Anton LaVey, who is the founder of the Church of Satan, refers to an occult principle known as the law of the trapezoid. So we seem to have a very occult room here, which is dedicated to a god that can be served under any name. Hmm. The one that I know has one name. One name. One could tell several moving stories, writes Robert Miller, the spiritual godfather, if you like, of the United Nations and the former uh, Under Secretary General. One could tell several moving stories of the spiritual transformation of the United Nations as caused to the point that this little speck on earth is becoming holy ground. For example, the rational intellectual economist Doug Hammarskjöld found God at the United Nations and inspiration for his work as a world servant in the mystics of the Middle Ages. Oh, so we didn't find it from the Bible, he found it where? From the mystics. Towards the end of his markings overflow with spirituality and mysticism. There you are, the words of the United Nations themselves or their representatives telling us how this inspiration came about. Now let's go back a little bit to Foster and Alice Bailey. These were Alice A. Bailey, the one who received dictated messages from Dwal Kool and who is known as the prophetess of the New Age. They started a group called World Goodwill, an official non-governmental organization within the United Nations. The stated aim of this group is to cooperate in the world of preparation for the reappearance of the Christ. So the United Nations, in other words, is an organization preparing to get all the religion, all the governments together, yes. But that is just on a political level. The agenda behind it is to bring all the religions together and to prepare it for the coming of Christ. Which Christ? Not Jesus Christ, but the cosmic Christ. Because Jesus Christ is not coming, as we will see in a future lecture, to do what they think is going to happen. Their Christ wants to have a kingdom here on earth. But God says, my kingdom is not of this earth. Now, let's have a look at this man, Robert Miller. There he is. Dr. Robert Miller, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Chancellor of the United Nations University of Peace, and he's Chairperson of the Peace Party 2000. He's a very prominent man. What does he write? Robert Miller. Decide to open yourself to God, to the universe, to all your brethren and sisters, to your inner self to the potential of the human race, to the infinity of your inner self, and you will become the universe. You will become infinity, and you will at long last, your, you will be at long last your real, divine, stupendous self. There you have the same philosophy. So what is he saying? That we can become gods. Alright, so that is the mover and the shaker of the philosophy of the United Nations. Robert Miller writes in World Core Curriculum the following. Now this is stunning. 
the underlying philosophy upon which the Robert Miller School... Now, what is the Robert Miller School? We'll have to come to that. Robert Miller School is the education program for the entire world as will be enforced by the United Nations. That's scary. Let's read on. The underlying philosophy upon which the Robert Miller School is based will be found in the teaching set forth in the books of Alice A. Bailey. Hello? The books of Alice A. Bailey were published originally by Lucifer Publishing Company, which, because of all the flack, they changed to Lucifer's Trust. Isn't that correct? The school is now certified as a United Nations Associated School providing education for international cooperation and peace. Okay, this is big business. So the philosophy is based on Luciferian channeled writings preparing for the coming of Lucifer. And remember what they said. They were quite open about it. Alice A. Bailey claimed, evidence of the growth of human intellect along the needed receptive lines for the preparation of the New Age can be seen in the planning of various nations and in the efforts of the United Nations to formulate a world plan. From the very start of this enfoldment, three occult factors have governed the development of all these plans. Now, can you see why I call the lecture the UN and the occult agenda? Because Alice A. Bailey says there were three occult plans and Robert Miller says, yes, we follow the writings of Alice A. Bailey. She did not spell them out, but she did state, within the United Nations is a germ and seed of a great international and meditating reflective group. A group of thinking and informed men and women in whose hands lies the destiny of humanity. Ooh. This is largely under the control of many fourth-ray disciples, if you could but realize it, and their point of meditative focus is the intuitional or buddhic plane, the plane upon which all hierarchical activity is today to be found. That's about as occult as you can get. What she is saying is that the inner core of the United Nations is controlled by people who are under the control of Lucifer. That's what she's saying. She's saying it's demonic. And it's out of her words, not mine. I'm just reading. That's what's such fun about all of this. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy. She was the forerunner, of course, of the Bailey books. And Theosophy was then taken over by Annie Ward Basant over here, and then taken over by Alice A. Bailey. And here is the great invocation that has to be read and learnt by every child in the future from the point of light within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth from the point of love within the heart of God. Let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. But this Christ is not Jesus Christ. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. Oh, how neat. It's so derogatory. The purpose which the masters know and serve. What arrogance. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. This is interesting. Which door is to be sealed where evil dwells? Well, if you know occult science, you'll know that they call light darkness and darkness light and they say that Jesus is the evil one. We read all those quotes when we did the, the lecture on that issue. May it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Restore what plan? Restore whose plan? And who made it so that it is not restored? Well, who separated the nations? God separated the nations. What is the focus of the United Nations to? Unite the nations. So they want to restore that which the, in inverted commas, evil one happened to mess up with one brilliant move of confusing the languages. Well, just goes to show one word of God and he's confused for four and a half thousand years. Who's really in control here? Well, here's Annie Basant in her 33 degree Freemason regalia. 
co-masonry, remember we dealt with this issue. The theosophy textbook te teaches immortality, reincarnation, the deity of man. Statements by this Dwal Kul who also inspired Alice A. Bailey. He says, talks about Alice A. Bailey, know me still by another name and office, A.A.B. Alice A. Bailey knows who I am and recognizes me by two of my names. Now that's interesting because there are two names and we will see the two names in a future lecture, what the names are and then it gets very interesting. This is a detective story. It's a very exciting one. Well, the Bible says that they are spirits of demons, working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 14. Remember that? Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of this movement, of which Alice A. Bailey became the high priestess, if you like, said Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only one. Then she talks about the virgin who is Satan and Lucifer at the same time and the Holy Ghost all wrapped in one. So whether you call him Isis or whether you call him Osiris doesn't matter. Whether you call him Baal and Ashtoreth, doesn't matter. Two names. He always comes under two names, two principles. Alice A. Bailey, she succeeded Besant as leader of theosophy. Her husband was a 32 degree Freemason and also, of course, part of co-masonry. There she is. Priestess and prophetess of the New Age movement who received these messages from this spirit entity which has to be a demon Dwal Kul. Her writings, as we have said, one of two women to be one of the most prolific writers of modern times. Her main aim, the problems of humanity, getting all humanity together again and preparing the world for the coming of Christ. And we have read this quote already, I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one. One is an acronym in the occult for Lucifer and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. I have no other life intention. She writes, the Tibetan, this is now this Dwalku, has asked me to make clear that when he is speaking of the Christ, he is referring to his official name as head of the hierarchy. The Christ works for all men irrespective of their faith. He does not belong to the Christian world any more than to the Bud Buddhist or Mohammedan or any other faith. There is no need for any man to join the Christian church in order to be affiliated with Christ. So obviously it's not Christianity. The requirements are to love your fellow men, lead a disciplined life, recognize the divinity in all faiths and all beings and rule your daily life with love. Love, 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 until it drips. That's the modern gospel. You're never allowed to warn anyone. You're never allowed to talk about sin. You're never allowed to talk about salvation. You're never allowed to point to Jesus Christ as the only Savior. That's contrary to the law of love. Isn't that sick? If you love someone, don't you warn them of the hazards and the problems ahead? First of all, he will come to a world which is essentially one world, Alice A. Bailey wrote. So it doesn't even have to be a fully united world. The major effect of his appearance will surely be to demonstrate in every land the effect of a spirit of inclusiveness. Now, I want you to ponder this. This is very important. So his main aim will be to develop a spirit of inclusiveness inclusiveness and inclusiveness which will be channeled or expressed through him so his spirit will work to bring this about all who seek right human relations will be gathered automatically to him uh -huh. so not all who seek Jesus Christ no all who seek right human relations can you see the emphasis to mankind again all who seek these will automatically be gathered to him, whether they are in one of the great world religions or not. So we need a spirit of inclusiveness. But let's continue. All who see no true or basic difference between religion and religion, or between man and man, 
or nation and nation will rally around him. Have you got that? So if, there's, if I see no difference between Christianity and Buddhism, and I see no difference between Hinduism and Christianity, I will rally around him. If I see no difference between the nations, I will rally around him. Now those who embody the spirit of exclusiveness and separateness will stand automatically and equally revealed and all men will know them for what they are. Oh, nice. What does the Bible say on this issue? The Bible says, come out and be separate. The Bible asks for a spirit of separateness. The United Nations, by its very nature, has no option but to ask for a spirit of inclusiveness. But now what if the high movers behind the scenes are actually occultists and Luciferians? Wouldn't that be kind of scary? Because who would be the head honcho of the team then, behind the scenes? Satan. Satan would be the head honcho. He would be the main guy. Now the trouble is, this difference. Those who say come out and be separate, they're going to be in trouble. Those who say, well, let's be inclusive, they'll be okay. The reply comes with clarity. He will come unfailingly when a measure of peace has been restored. We don't have to have world peace. Just a measure of peace. Alice A. Bailey continues, the major required preparation for the coming of the Christ is a world at peace. However, that peace must be based on an educated goodwill which will lead inevitably to right human relations and therefore to the establishments of, on lines of light between nation and nation, religion and religion, group and group, man and man. So the only way we're going to have uh, this community is by putting everybody into the melting pot and becoming one. That means giving up your differences. Discover the members of the new group of world service whenever possible and strengthen their hands. Look for them in every nation and expressing, expressing many lines of thoughts and points of view. Remember always that in doctrine and dogma and in techniques and methods they may differ widely from you, but in love for their fellow man, that has become the religion of the new world. Not love for God, love for the fellow man in practical goodwill and in devotion to the establishment of right human relations, they stand with you. They are your equals and can probably teach you much. So forget all about the religious differences. Promote ceaselessly the work of world goodwill so that every nation may have its own group of men and women dedicated to the establishment of right human relationships. The whole power has to shift to man rather than to God. It is on the foundation of this teaching that Christ will raise the superstructure of the brotherhood of man for right human relations on expression of the love of God. And this is all we hear in the sermonizing of the new world. What is important is right human relations. What is important is that we accept one another as we are. What we, and it goes on and on and on and on. But Faithfulness to God? Biblical principles? No, they have to be given up. Share International says, but the day will dawn when the vision of the United Nations will save the world and when the reality of the United Nations starts bearing fruit, then the breath of immortality will be a living reality on earth. And there is the spiritual leader of the, or the present priest, if you like, in the United Nations, the Hindu Sri Chimnoy, he says the United Nations is the way, the way to oneness that leads to the supreme oneness, capitalized. It is like a river flowing towards the source, the ultimate source. And the United Nations becomes for us the answer to world suffering, world darkness, world ignorance. The inner vision of the United Nations is the gift supreme. And this will be realized no matter how many years it takes. The Dalai Lama says, in the sphere of international relations, the sense of greater shared responsibility is particularly needed. Today, when the world is becoming increasingly interdependent, the dangers of irresponsible behavior have dramatically increased. Unless we realize that we now are part of one big human family, 
we cannot hope to bring about peace and happiness. So all the world leaders are saying these things. And the United Nations, with its symbolism of this ancient laurel wreath around a globe, is nothing other than the emulation of an old pagan ideal, which Lucifer once more wants to realize in the world that we live in today. As we have seen, the symbol of the United Nations is very similar to the old Hittite symbol, where you had in the center the face of the sun god, and now you just have a web, if you like, a spider's web, which is a symbol of Lucifer, and the encompassing earth. And of course, the laurel wreath was a symbol of all the ancient deities. So we find all for one, all together now, we are the world, was the 50th celebration of the United Nations. The New Age agenda was to merge God and nature. That's what Teilhard de Chardin, the father of the philosophy of the UN, said. We must become pantheistic, eradicate male-female distinction, world peace, nuclear disarmament, one world government, one world religion. The organizations leading up to this, the United Nations, of course, Council of Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Bilderbergers, Gorbachev Foundation, and the Club of Rome. And they've already put up a constitution which is known as the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. So we really have a world constitution. Now, obviously, if you want to bring about a situation like that, you have to influence the education of the world so that the mindset and the thinking of people is changed. So education is a very important point. This comes straight from their own web pages. <laughs> wow, you cannot say this is hearsay. It comes straight from them. You know the org. The world will not change and find peace if there is not a new education. You tant former Secretary General of the United Nations. We need a new education. The old one's no good. The former director of the World Health Organization, Dr. Brock Chisholm, of course, that's also a United Nations organization, says, to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism. That's kind of scary, don't you think? Loyalty to family traditions. Oh, that's even worse. National patriotism and religious dogmas. Now, these are the movers of the United Nations. Your individualism must go, you must become a number. Just doing what the state says. This is Marxism. The state is supreme and you are nothing but the catechumen, a goyim, a nothing. And you must give up your individuality. Did you know that Christ created us all free agents? Every single one of us? No one to be subject to anyone but God, because only to God can you trust your subjection, because he is 100% selflessness, which he proved when he came to this earth. How would you like to be a subject of Lucifer and be bound by chains to his chariots to do his whims? I would hate that. But in any case, in order to do that, you'll have to give up your individualism. Now let's have a look again at this man, Robert Miller. Philosopher, prophet of hope, top-level global statesman, and uh, what a mighty man. He's the Chancellor of the University of Peace, created by the United Nations. He... Uh, is the creator of what is known as the World Core Curriculum. That says everything. And is known throughout as the world as the father of global education. There are 29 Robert Miller schools around the world, more being established each year. World Core Curriculum earned him the UNESCO Peace Prize in 1989. He has recently drawn up a framework for world media coverage. What you see on your television is what you're supposed to see not what you should see. As a public service, as well as a framework for planetary and cosmic consciousness. Wow, so your mindset, your cultural mindset must be changed, your framework for the arts and culture. These are occultists speaking. After all, he said so himself. He says he follows Alice A. Bailey. He's the author of the World Core Curriculum. What does that do? Everything is a quote. 
steer our children towards global citizenship, earth-centered beliefs, socialist values, the collective mindset, which is becoming a requirement of the 20th century workforce. Your children will have to be modified. We are living in a frightening world. Good. Robert Miller, what does he write about a world core curriculum? He says a world core curriculum might seem utopian today, but by the end of the year 2000, have we passed that? Yes. It will be down to earth daily reality in, what does it say there? All the schools of the world. Now, I believe you me, I have been in the education system. I officially left the education system one month ago. And what I have seen in the last few years, the changes are hair-raising. Hair-raising. If that is what is awaiting us, then God help this world. We've already seen, he says, the philosophy is based on Alice A. Bailey. And World Core Curriculum, this is unol.org, that is their own one. What is their teaching? Our planetary home, place in the universe, our place in time, that's all the evolution stories. The family of humanity, that's global humanity, the miracle of individual life, and the coordinating centers of the world, where they all are, the Robert Miller Schools International, what do they teach? Well, they teach, they have, for example, the Shaman Institute, and they have all these nice, interesting occult signs for all the things that they stand for, elusis, the all-seeing eyes, humanistic psychology. This is one of the Robert Miller School's teaching points. Here is Franco, a shamanic facilitator, astrology, sacred circle operator, author of Initiation and Astro-Shamanism. He talks to inner guides. What else? He says the workshop offers practical tools for journeying into ecstatic dimensions, beyond conventional time. He says the program includes shamanic journeys, drumming, ceremonial sharing, soul retrieving, connection with guides and spirits. This is spiritism of the worst kind. This is forbidden in the Bible. No wonder the Bible is not part of this organization's book. Robert Miller says, at the world level, the UN has adopted a world economic development strategy. Food, agriculture, world, there's a world food plan, a world health plan, a world literacy plan, a world employment plan, a world industry plan. They've got every single detail of our lives sewn up. Now, another organization that's very important is UNESCO. And let's just look at UNESCO. It's a sub-organization of the United Nations. Julian Huxley is the former director of UNESCO. He was Humanist of the Year. He's a theistic philosopher, member of the Communistic Colonial Bureau of British Fabian Society, and signer of the Humanist Manifesto too. That's not a very good recommendation as far as I'm concerned. Some more. Skull and Bones member Archibald MacLeish wrote the UNESCO Constitution. So he must be an Illuminati member, as we saw in that lecture on the secret behind secret societies. So Freemasons helped create the organization, a fervent international MacLeish. He is associated with one worldism. Here's another one. Niebuhr is UNESCO's co-founder and he signed Siecos. Now what does that mean? Which appeared in 1969 and uh, they printed it in the New York Times then. What is Siecos? This is, these are the founders. It is the position of CECOS that contraceptive services should be available to all, including minors, who should enjoy the same rights of free and independent access to contraceptive care as do others. It is the position of CECOS that the use of explicit sexual material, sometimes referred to as pornography, can serve a variety of important needs in the lives of countless individuals. These are nice people up there in the United Nations. No wonder now it is forced curriculum at even junior schools to have explicit sexual details explained all in the names of preventing sexual diseases with the most strange and lurid acts which have to be performed. In fact, our universities are granting honorary doctorates to those who are the most perverse on the stage. Yes. 
Huxley, who was the initial chairman, in its educational program can stress the ultimate need for world political unity, familiarize all people with the implications of transfer of full sovereignty, and etc., etc. So these people are all birds of a feather. UNESCO explains, if UNESCO is attacked on the grounds that it is helping to prepare the world's people for world government, then it is an error to burst forth with apologetic statements and denials. Let us face it, the job of UNESCO is to help create and promote the elements of world citizenship. When faced with such a charge, let us by all means affirm it from the housetops. That's what UNESCO says itself. So they're not denying anything. Under Huxley's guidance, they prepared a guidebook for teachers. Now, I would like the parents to take a note. Everybody with little children or have children with little children, take note. What is the United Nations guidebook for teachers? It says, reminds them that the destruction of a child's love of country and patriotism is the first step in educating that child for world citizenship. Now let's have a look at what the guidebook contains. Volume 5, page, on the opening page. In the classroom with children under 13 years of age, before the child enters school, his mind has already been profoundly marked, often injuriously by earlier influences, first gained, however dimly, in the home. Oh, that's interesting. So this must be changed. Who is putting these thoughts into the minds of children then? The parents. That must be changed. So UNESCO's aim is to change the mindset of your children to turn it against any values that the parents might instill in the mind of that child. Isn't that breaking the fifth commandment, yes or no? Honor your father and your mother that you may have a long life. Isn't this breaking the fifth commandment? I think it is. On page 8, the teacher is told, the kindergarten or infant school has a significant part to play in the child's education. Not only can it correct many of the errors of home training, but can also prepare the child for membership at about age seven in a group of his own age and habits, the first of many such social identifications that he must achieve on his way to membership in a world society. Aha, the kindergarten. So now, the governments of the world are saying, you must send your kids to school earlier. Did you know that? That the governments are beginning to say that? And England now passed a rule when? This year. This very year. Guess when kids go to school from this year onwards in England? Age three. Yes, age three. You have to send them to preschool. That's nice. The mothers love it because they don't have to take care of the kids. But who's controlling the mindset of the kids? And who's behind it? occultists. Page 58 of the guidebook to teachers says, as we have pointed out, it is frequently the family that infects the child with extreme nationalism. The school should therefore use the means as described earlier to combat family attitudes. Now nationalism is not their ultimate game. What is their real game? Religion. Religion. Volume 5, page 11. In our view, history and geography should be taught at this age at a universal history and geography, the study of history raises problems of value which are better postponed until the pupil is freed from nationalist prejudice which is pr present surrounds the teaching of history. So the whole mindset of the child must be changed in the teaching program and this is UNESCO's aim. Not a very, well, noble aim, I don't think, because the authority of religion and parents, especially Christian religion, will be undermined. Now another organization comes in, this is called the Finhorn Organization, and they promote ecological health and prosperity. Have you heard much about ecology in the world today? Yes. Now, again, we have to find the links. You always have to do some detective work. Because Francis, this is Francis of Assisi, connected with nature, Pope John Paul II named him the patron saint of ecology. Now, St. Francis was the roommate of Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuit founder, just for interest's sake. It is on St. Francis' day that thousands of people flock to St. John the Divine, oh, how boring, cathedral for the blessing of the beasts. Also, occultist Robert Miller, that's now the Secret Under Secretary General of the United Nations, former one, informs us that 
Francis has been declared patron saint of the United Nations. The Pope does it, the United Nations follows. Who's really in control? The Pope. And there he is, if you want to, you can pray to him. If you don't want to, you can ignore it. The UN Secretary General Youth Hunt formed the organization Planetary Citizens with New Age activist Donald Keyes. Now we're getting the links. Here's the top man in the United Nations with Donald Keyes, Planetary Citizen, is now a global government organization within the UN specifically devoted to preparing people for the coming of a new culture. Now, let's go on with Donald Keyes. He's together with Yutan. Donald Keyes has been actively involved in Finhorn. Have you got the link? United Nations, Secretary General Yutan, Donald Keyes, Finhorn. In Scotland and writes regularly for its magazine, One Earth. Keyes wrote... The New Age groups are focusing on entering a new stage, a world-related stage. They are becoming mature enough to begin to shoulder some of the load of humanity's burdens. The spread of New Age values as unifying yeast in the human loaf may be the critical ingredient for successful emergence from the 1980s onwards. Now let's see what Finhorn is all about. Here we go. Their logo is the flame of Lucifer. They use uh, occult symbols, they use the lotus flower, they talk about divinely ordinary, divinely human. So what are they saying? We're God, and God spoke to me. Now who's that God that speaks to them? Well, let's ask their spokesman. This is David Spangler. There's one of his books, Parents as Parent as Mystic, Mystic as Parent. So th this is what your education is going to do to your kids. Do you know that? David Spangler, co-director, spokesperson for Finon Community in Northern Scotland. That's what it looks like today. Let's see what he says. He writes in the Reflections of Christ, The true light of Lucifer cannot be seen through sorrow, through darkness, through the rejection. The true light of this great being can only be recognized when one's own eyes can see with the light of the Christ, the light of the inner sun. Lucifer works within each one of us to bring us to wholeness. Uh, and as we move into the new age, which is the age of man's wholeness, they love that word, wholeness, each of us in some way is brought to the point which is termed Lucif which are termed Luciferic initiation. The particular doorway through which the individual must pass if he is to come fully into the presence of his light and wholeness, Lucifer comes to give us the final gift of wholeness. So who are these people actually worshipping? Lucifer, directly. Lucifer prepares man in all ways for the experience of Christhood. Oh, we become Christ. And Christ prepares man for the experience of God. But the light that reveals to us the presence of the Christ, the light that reveals to us the path of Christ comes from Lucifer. He is the light giver. He is aptly named the morning star because it is his light that heralds for man the dawn of a greater consciousness. David Spangler. There he says it. Straight out. David Spangler writes, We can take all the scriptures and all the teachings, and all the tablets, and all the laws, and all the marshmallows, and have a jolly good bonfire and marshmallow roast, because that is all they are worth. Okay. I don't think they like the Bible very much, or the law of God. These are the movers and shakers of the United Nations. They're waiting for a new economic order. We are, I'm not going to go into those details. We affirm that the economy of all nations is a seamless web. They want to join it together and uh, a new international economic order. That's World Goodwill Commentary, all there by itself. We, the members of the United Nations, solemnly proclaim our united determination to work urgently for the establishment of a new economic international order. The whole world is going to be controlled at every single level by these people. A complete change in the world's financial and economic order is imperative. Benjamin Cream, spokesman for Maitreya. So, UN General Assembly says new international economic order. And so we have all these strange happenings. Buckminster Fuller says, don't give me any other job. Just let me be head of the World Food Authority and I'll have the whole world at my feet tomorrow. They're going to use food to create enough tension to make everyone accept this. Benjamin Cream also wrote, the industrialists, economists, administrators of great experience and achievement who with a hierarchy, that's a bunch of demons by the way, 
have worked out plans and blueprints which will solve the redistribution problems of the world when the political will is there to implement them. So that means when they start stealing from those who have and give it to all the others. Matreya himself, this New Age Christ. The UN is the major hope of the world. In its interrelationships we can see democracy writ large, the symbol for the expression of God's will that men call goodwill. With the advent of the Christ, this goodwill will bring all men and all nations into correct relationships and create the necessary circumstances for the expression of that synthesis which will be the outstanding keynote of the coming civilization. In this vast enterprise, the UN will play a major role. Remember Revelation 17? The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose, to give their power and authority to the beast, and they will make war against the Lamb. Ten regions, according to Gary H. Carr, the Club of Rome divided the world into and wrote the new constitution. And we have this new civilization and it was held at the Fairmont Hotel, Masonic Auditorium in San Francisco. Conference document says, we are experiencing the birth of a first global civilization, a historic, timely, global initiative. 1995. And there it was. And they were ready for it. CIA, NATO, MI5, CRI, all of these have occult symbols in them which we don't have to go into details. The Trilateral Commission, the 666, the 666 is in the Federal Reserve, SSS, that was the original sixth letter of the Greek alphabet, F is the sixth letter of our alphabet, this all spells 666. Now, what about these world religions? Now, this is the crux of the matter. And if we can concentrate on this issue tonight, this will be the hub of what is going to happen. Was it not inevitable that the UN would sooner or later also acquire a spiritual dimension? That's what Robert Miller says, the big man behind world education, world media, University of Peace, all of these things. Robert Miller writes, there's a famous poster which shows Christ knocking at the tall United Nations building, wanting to enter it. I often visualize in my mind another even more accurate painting, that of the United Nations, which would be the body of Christ. Interesting. Doesn't Christ say my kingdom is not of this world? So this is another kingdom, and this Christ is definitely not Jesus Christ. He then refers to Pope John Paul said that we are stone cutters and artisans of a cathedral which we might never see in its finished beauty. Ah, this is Masonic language that Pope John Paul II is talking about. The tapestry of its work encompasses the total condition of humankind on this planet. All this is part of one of the most prodigious pages of evolution. It will require the detachment and objectivity of future historians to appraise fully what happened in the last third of our century and to understand the real significance of what the United Nations was. No human force will ever be able to destroy the United Nations. Very interesting. For the United Nations is not a mere building or a mere idea. It is not a man-made creation. This is Robert Miller speaking. Under sec former Under Secretary General of the United Nations. If it wasn't man-made, then who made it? Who made it if it, man didn't make it? Well, they told us who the leader is in so many words. Who is he? Lucifer. Okay. The United Nations is the vision light of the absolute supreme Masonic signal language, which is slowly, steadily, and unerringly illuminating, you know the buzzwords by now, the ignorance, the night of our human life. The divine success and supreme progress of the United Nations is bound to become a reality. At his choice hour, the absolute supreme will ring his own victory bell here on earth, through the loving and serving heart of the United Nations. Wow! This is a bomber! He's going to ring his victory bell. Thank you, Robert Muller. What else do you have to say on the issue? 
Decide to open yourself to the potential of the human race, to the infinity of your inner self, and you will become the universe at long last, your real divine self. That really puts it all in the picture. I'm more and more drawn to some of the very simple but extremely important teachings of the Christ and of all the great prophets and visionaries. I'm increasingly convinced that what they foresaw is the beginning to become a reality on the planet and that humanity is transcending or metamorphosing itself into what those great dreamers and visionaries and prophets envisioned. We're changing. We're going to undergo a change. The world's major religions in the end all want the same thing. Do they? Even though they were born in different places, different circumstances, what the world needs today is a convergence of the different religions in the search and definition of the cosmic and divine laws which ought to regulate the behavior on this planet. Worldwide, spiritual ecumenism expressed in new forms of religious cooperation institutions would probably be closest to the hearts of the resurrected Christ. Thank you. Very interesting. Peace will be impossible, Robert Muller speaking, without the taming of fundamentalism through a united religions that professes faithfulness only to the global spirituality and the health of the planet. So fundamentalism has to be tamed. Let's start with Islam. Where do you think they will end? Certainly with Christianity. The new world religion must be based on those truths which have stood the test of the ages. They are steadily taking shape in human thinking and for them the United Nations fight. My great personal dream, writes Robert Miller, is to get a tremendous alliance between all the major religions and the United Nations. Well, this is fascinating stuff. There will be, not be any dissociation between the universal church and the sacred lodge of all true masons and the inner circle of the esoteric society. That said Alice A. Bailey. Robert Miller says that's their philosophy. So there you have it. Freemasonry, Luciferianism, this is the kingdom on earth. June 1995, an interfaith summit conference was held in San Francisco for the purpose of uniting the world's religions into a global organization, the United Religions Organization, called UR. It will be an international, interreligious organization modeled after and affiliated with the United Nations, According to its literature, so it's Howard Dispatch Ministry, the URO launched its written charter in June 1997. The institution should be fully in place by June 2000, globally operational by June 2005. How far is that off? Oh, that's just around the corner. I get excited. Cooperating closely with the UN and its organizations to complement the UN's political, diplomatic, etc. The Interfaith Conference, Anglican Bishop William E. Swing issued the challenge for a new global civilization. He said, we stand on the threshold of a new world order that may be defined either by an increasing polarization that fuels a spiral of escalating conflict and violence, or by growing global cooperation that calls the human race to work across national, ethnic and religious boundaries to serve a larger global good. See where we're heading? Robert Miller, and this is very exciting, Dispatch Magazine. Do not worry if not all religions will join the United Religions Organization. Many nations did not join the UN at the beginning, but later regretted it and made every effort to join. It was the same with the European community. It will be the case with the world's religions because whoever stays out or aloof will sooner or later regret it. Wow. Now, that's fascinating. Where are we going? Sooner or later regret it. This man over here is Joseph Reed. He's the under Secretary General of the United Nations currently. And here he's speaking at uh, a huge convention of Seventh-day Adventists. And he's going to tell them exactly who 
is going to be in control. Let's listen to him. I make this appeal because the United Nations is also your organization, our world organization, your United Nations. Delegates, please remember, the United Nations is the only machinery we have for collective cooperation among all nations. It is the only worldwide institution for furthering development. The United Nations is the only universal mechanism for protecting human rights. The United Nations is the only shared framework for strengthening international law. Delegates, the United Nations is not one of the luxuries of international life. The work of the United Nations is of vital importance for the betterment of life on our planet. That's very fascinating. The United Nations is also your organization. It is the only body for this, that, that, and the other. Now, that's not the speech he wrote. He read it for Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, I have a problem. I don't want to be part of a Luciferian organization. I certainly don't want to be. That's just me, personally. The mystical tradition in the mainline denominations easily interact with those of the heathen religions of the world. Meditation practices, visualization techniques, breathing exercises are now being used to tap into spiritual realm. And this, such religious leaders as Pope, the Pope and the Dalai Lama are very much on the same plan. Discernment Newsletter, 1996. A religion to fit everyone. Goals of this one world religion, world goodwill, remember this is all UN affiliated organizations, founded by the very highest level of people. The churches in, and the world religions should indicate the unity within all facets of truth, which will provide a universal platform one to which all men everywhere could give allegiance. Such a platform should include the truth that all men are divine. Thank you. Can we do that? Yes or no? I hope not. The truth that evolution governs the growth of the human being. I don't believe in that either. Each individual is a god. All men are divine and the belief in evolution, the fact of immortality and of eternal persistence, reincarnation, arising from man's essential divinity. The Bible clearly teaches us that there is no such thing as reincarnation, for it is appointed unto men once to die. These are all taken from direct quotes. Preparation for, by men and women of goodwill is needed to introduce new values, new standards, and new attitudes, prepare for a coming world teacher, requirements of a new world order, and a reorganization of social structure. I want nothing to do with that. I want nothing to do with that. Alice A. Bailey writes, the same old formulas, the same old theologies, the same old interpretations are deemed adequate to meet men's modern needs and inquiries. They are not. The church today is the tomb of the Christ and the stone of theology has been rolled to the door of the sepulchre. Oh, Jesus and his theology, goodbye, goodbye. She writes, the day is dawning when all the religions will be regarded as emanating from one great spiritual source. All will be seen as unitedly providing one root out of which the universal world religion will inevitably emerge. Then there will be neither Christian nor heathen, neither Jew nor Gentile, but simply one great body of believers gathered out of all the current religions. That sounds nice. But whose religion will it be? They will accept the same truths, not as theological concepts, but as essential to spiritual living. They will stand together on the same platform of brotherhood and of human relations. They will recognize 
divine sonship will seek unitedly to cooperate with the divine plans. Such a world religion is no idle dream, but something which is definitely forming today. World Goodwill Letter, 1993, quoting it. These are United Nations organizations. So obviously, the world is going to move towards this unified platform, and there will be some who propagate a spirit of separateness. Is that correct? Can we see that emerging? And then there will be conflict. And Robert Miller says that those who do not want to go along with this will sooner or later come to regret it. So obviously we're heading for a clash. Thus the expressed aims and efforts of the United Nations will be eventually brought to function and a new church of God gathered out of all the religions and spiritual groups. Wow. A new church of God. I don't want to be part of that new church of God. I find it nauseating. Miller also said, we must hope also that the Pope will come before the year 2000 to the United Nations, speak for all the religions and spiritualities on this planet, and give the world the religious view of how the third millennium should be a spiritual millennium, a millennium which will see the integration and harmony of humanity. Who must be the spokesman for this new world religion? The Pope. The plan is coming together. Revelation is unfolding. This is exactly what the Bible speaks about what will happen. Instead of becoming dejected and miserable, then lift up your heads and start smiling. Because we're going home. This is exciting. The world's major religions must speed up dramatically their ecumenical movement and recognize the unity of their objectives and diversity of, of their cults. Religions must actively cooperate to bring to unprecedented heights, a better understanding of the mysteries of life and of our place in the universe, my religion, right or wrong, and my nation, right or wrong, must be abandoned forever in the planetary age. You're not allowed to say Jesus is the only way. It must be abandoned forever. I'm sorry, I will not abandon it. I refuse. And then we had this wonderful meeting. The Pope actually did appear before the United Nations. And then they came together in this massive rehearsal at the United Nations where they formed this new ecumenical initiative funded by Ted Turner. And the whole world is gathering into one new religious pot under the United Nations. And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13, 3. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your forefathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the decisions we have to make. Those are the issues before us. And the sad thing is, I'm not making this up. I'm just reading it off the screen. I'm really not making this up. I wish I was, but I'm not. So we are actually facing a crisis situation. But in the lectures that are now coming, we will have to look at the other side of the coin. We've had enough of this side of the coin, don't you think? I'm sick to death of it already. Now let's have a look whether God has an answer to what Satan is planning. Now I handed out, or I had handed out another little card over here, and I've got a question on there. I'm beginning to see that the battle is not really political. Did you see that tonight? The battle is not really political, but the religio-political. They want your allegiance and your mind. I see that the devil has it so set up that the whole world, and even if possible the very elect, are to be deceived and mesmerized by his devices. By God's grace, the second point, I do not want to be one of those that are deceived. 
I see that it is more than just being aware of the problem. I see that I will have to make a concerted effort to find truth and to become and remain undeceived. What is the only channel whereby we can find out the will of God? You tell me. The Bible. If God hadn't given us the Bible, we would be hopelessly at sea. Thank God, God gave us the Bible. What would we do without it? I wouldn't know where we're going. It would all seem logical. It would all seem okay. Everybody would be happy to climb onto this bandwagon, right or wrong. I want to know how Jesus will be victor in this controversy. All we've seen is Satan build up his kingdom. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation is about. I'm interested in learning more and to plan to attend the next lectures because this is where the counter plan of God will start to be discussed. We're now going to go back to the Bible and we're going to find out what God has in store for us. But if I could just be so daring as to ask, just show me your hands if you want to. Who sees that Jesus is being eradicated from the world plan? Who sees it? Wow, so there's a total onslaught on Jesus Christ. And we are just caught in the battle. Isn't that right? We're just caught in the battle. So what hope have we got of changing the status quo? None. None. If you think you can change this, forget it. We have no hope. Who is our only hope? Jesus Christ. He is our only hope. Without him, we are nothing. And that's why I can stand here today, because I know there's nothing I can do, but he can do something. He's even made it possible for me to stand here and speak to you. Isn't that great? All things are possible. Do you know that I've given these lectures in a Masonic hall? Yes, all things are possible. Absolutely amazing.